Good morning. Uh, I hope everyone can hear us. We should be live. Um, and we're very uh, privileged to, for you to be able to join us today. Uh, we can see at the moment we've got around about 190 or so people. Hopefully you're having uh, less technical difficulties than we are um, so far. We appreciate uh, your patience uh, and stay tuned. Hopefully if we uh, keep a strong feed, we'll uh, get through this uh, fantastic hour um, ahead of us. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dan. We'll do a few introductions in a little minute. I'm one of the national program managers at Smart Recovery. Uh, we're running this webinar today uh, and called it Motivation to Management. And I guess it's uh, looking at motivational interviewing um, and I guess asking some questions uh, from our esteemed guest today. Uh, and then maybe trying to relate it for some of you who are uh, facilitating and familiar with Smart Recovery in regards to SMART standing for self-management and recovery training. So what I might do, uh, I'll just do a brief uh, welcome and introduction. Um, hopefully you can see the screen. I'm just minimizing it slightly. As I say, my name's Dan. Uh, I'm one of the National Program Managers, and we also have Anjoa here um, at the moment. Um, Anjoa is one of the other National Program Managers at SMART Recovery. We're a very small team in Australia of seven. Uh, but we know that Smart Recovery is a larger family um, all over uh, the world in 25 different countries. So it's great, hopefully, to see uh, some of you joining us from USA and Canada. I think there was someone from Colombia and Denmark and Ireland as well. So fantastic. Um, so what I might just do is hand over to Ange uh, just to do a welcome to country, and then I will invite our guest speaker on to uh, the platform and to Angela. Um, hello, Bill. Lovely to have you here. Um, I'd like to pay my respects um, to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that we're meeting on multiple lands. Um, I think Dan's talking to us from um, Kwandamuka country um, in Queensland. I'm meeting from Gadigal land. I know that Bill's um, joining us from Albuquerque in um, New Mexico and I understand that's Navajo Nation. Is that correct, Bill? Yeah. Um, it's nearby. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so correct me, I'm not sure exactly where you are. Um, but I'd like to kind of acknowledge the strength and tenacity of Aboriginal people. Um, welcome Aboriginal people here today and everybody else. Um, and just sort of um, hope that this is a wonderful and empowering webinar for all of us. So thank you so much, Bill, for being here. Thank you, Ange. Thank you, Ange. Um, so we're just going to do a question and answer session. We um, sent out um, some notification to many of you a few weeks ago um, just to come up with a few questions that you might want to ask Bill. And we'll try and systematically go through them, have a bit of a discussion around them in the hour that we have. Uh, you can pose questions uh, in the question section of the chat box function. However, we may or may not be able to see them depending on how many come through. So apologies if we don't get around to them, but uh, we'll try and keep an eye on them uh, and try and uh, give our guests the, the, the best um, time spent here today. So um, I will introduce you officially, Bill. I didn't put anything on the PowerPoint because I don't. I think I would run out of time um, in regards to your uh, accolades and different things, but uh, I would just officially like to welcome uh, what we someone that's uh, over 45 years, a world renowned clinical psychologist, emeritus, uh, distinguished professor of psychology, psychiatry at the University of Mexico, author and co author of over 30 books, I believe, and co founder of Motivational Interview. And uh, again, thank you, uh, Bill Miller. We welcome you today, and thank you so much for this time spent with you today. Thank you. So, um, if it's okay, we may just get into the questions, Bill. Uh, and as I say, myself and Ange may just tag team so that uh, not everyone's uh, trying to find it difficult to last, listen to the Scotsman in the room uh, and maybe understand uh, a mixed variety of accents here today. So, so Bill, uh, if we get started with, with question one, um, I have put the questions up here. You may or may not see them, uh, those are observing, but uh, number one is, what was it that initially motivated you to begin with with MI and what have been the main over the years and the way it's evolved? Well, it's important to understand how motivational interviewing happened. Uh, 
it didn't begin with a theory. Uh, I was I was on a sabbatical leave in Norway, and I didn't go there with any notion of something like motivational interview. Uh, it simply didn't exist. Uh, I was doing some lecturing there, but I was also meeting with the psychologists at this alcoholism treatment facility, and they wanted to uh, practice. They wanted to uh, have me demonstrate for them and actually practice ways of talking to patients. And so they would portray patients that they were seeing in English, happily, and, and ask me to respond. Uh, to some of the most difficult things they were struggling with. And so I just did my best to show how I was talking to people. And they did something that my American students just didn't do or, or very rarely did. While we were doing a, a role play, while I was demonstrating, they would interrupt me. And they would say, now, that, stop just a minute here. What are you thinking right now? I mean, what an interesting question that is. What, what's going on in your head? Uh, well, you asked a question of this person, but you could have asked many questions. Why did you ask that particular question? Or you're teaching us how to do reflective listening. And I noticed you did reflect something that the patient said, but the patient said many things. Why did you reflect that piece? Hmm. And what happened was they evoked from me some decision rules that I was using and I was not conscious of, uh, the essence of which were to cause the person to make the arguments for change rather than my doing so. Uh, I was assiduously avoiding telling people what they needed to do or what's wrong with them and so on. And in then about what was going on in their lives, what they thought about. I do about it. Um, and so it's, it's sort of a switching of roles and certainly different from what was being done in addiction treatment in America in the 1970s and 80s, which was pretty authoritarian, confrontational, shut up and I'll tell you what to do. Uh, so this was at like at the other end of the universe and very much more uh, Carl Rogers, which is, is part of the training that I'd had in, in graduate school as well. So over time, we began to clarify what are these rules about how you have a conversation with patients. And we started writing them down. And I gave it the name motivational interviewing, which hadn't occurred to me before, because it's about the person's motivation. And it, it is like an interview. It is like a conversation. Uh, it's not a, I'm going to tell you what to do. Uh, but just more like a conversation between people, both of whom have expertise. I, I have expertise by virtue of my training, uh, but also patients have expertise on themselves and they know more about themselves than anybody else does. Mm. And if what I'm gonna ask them to do is to make a change, I need their expertise to help me do that. So that, that's how it arose. It was literally evoked for me, which I love, because uh, it's consistent with the method. Uh, and having written it down, uh, one article got published. I thought that was the, it was just a description of it in 1983. I thought that was probably the last I would hear of it. And instead it took off like a rocket. Um, now, as, as you may know, the next really important thing happened in Australia. Uh, I was in Sydney on a second sabbatical leave uh, at the uh, National Center for Alcohol and Drug Research and found myself next to a fellow named Steve Rolnick, who was visiting there from Wales, South African by birth, but uh, on seconded from Wales. Now, it turns out Steve was the person who was the reviewer for that article that I submitted back in 1982. And he said, Miller, are you the guy that wrote that article on motivational interviewing? And I said, yeah, I'm really pleased that you read it. And uh, read it, I'm trying to teach this because treatment for addictions in the UK, and I don't even know if I'm doing it right. Uh, and you need to write more, he said. So instead we began having conversations and I'd come trying out role plays and I found that he, understood very, very well what I was 
writing about. And I said, so let's, why don't we write a book together? Uh, because he had a lot of experience in teaching this already, which I had not done that much of myself to that point. Doing uh, have really influenced it, and it it didn't spring full blown from a theory uh, or anything like that. It really came from very carefully observing clinical practice and asking good questions about it, and what are you doing and why are you doing it. And so then next came this phase of actually testing this out to see whether it worked, uh, and it turns out it does work pretty well. There are something over 1,400 clinical trials now uh, in the literature around the world. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's really interesting. And uh, I'm fortunate I've heard um, that story before when, when we uh, talked last. And, uh, yeah. and, and I think what, uh, in regards to, you know, there's been uh, new editions that have, have come out. Mm. Uh, what do you, how do you see do you see this emerging and, and developing more as time goes on and oh I never have known where it's going exactly people say where do you think motivational interviewing is going next and I usually say I really have no idea uh, because e each time we've written another edition it's been quite different even though there's yeah. a sameness to it it's been quite different I mean first of all it, by the second edition we were out of the addiction field uh, it had spread into so many other areas that the second edition was really about change more generally uh, yeah. and for providers more generally, not just in the, in the addiction field. Um, yeah. we, we realized that uh, the spirit of motivational interviewing was important because we saw people trying to use the techniques without understanding that spirit and it just felt wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so the mindset or the heart set was and we, we clarified the second edition and further in the third edition. Uh, so that's important. Between the mm. second and third edition, we came to understand a lot more about change talk through the work of a psycholinguist who was on our faculty who contributed a great deal. And we understand a lot more now about how change talk sounds and what it is and what it means. Uh, and so all of that emerged in the third edition as well. The, the process model for processes was new in the third edition. So it, it just keeps evolving mm. through the work of books all around. Yep. But I think that's really important, isn't it? Because if we get stuck in a specific modality, then we're never going to learn, we're never going to uh, develop and, and be able to provide the best, uh, I guess, treatment for or, or, or service for people if we're kind of stuck in the old way of thinking, you know. So, uh, I think that's really key and it's uh, really, really interesting. So, and have you any comments around that? Um, I'm just intrigued by the nature of it as a kind of iterative process, like something that you know we learn as we go, and um, it's, it's a notional thing that um, feeds on itself. Mm -hmm. And I, and still I love, learning. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I love um, what you were saying earlier, Bill, and I've heard you say this before. Sometimes we can think of it as being this little technique or a tool that we just pull out. Uh, and how I explain it to people when we're training them is it's kind of just a, a, a way of being with someone, you know. And I practice it in my day-to-day -day with my conversations. I, I, I say I, when I have meetings with my wife, We'll call them meetings. They're, they're norm, normally called dates, but when you've got young kids, it's normally a meeting. But uh, And I was talking to her about it, and she was like, is this you doing smart recovery on me? And I was like, I, I didn't even know I was using those skills with her because I practiced them with everybody I come with. I think that's the best way, I think, to, to learn that and just absorb the, the, the principles and the spirit of it, as you've mentioned. So I've been saying lately, well, motivational interviewing is a way of doing what else you do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good a good uh, way to look at it. Um, so, the second one: Do you think learning MI is fundamental to the therapeutic se setting? And, and if so, why do you think it is? I well, I do, and and actually, where I have moved since the third edition is to thinking of, of this as 
having to do with the qualities of, of an effective therapist or teacher or coach or diabetes educator. I mean, because there are large differences among therapists, counselors, teachers, whatever, in the outcomes of those they're working with. And what is it about them? And I think what we've been looking at for 30 years here, more now, is really what is it about a provider that makes them more effective in doing cognitive behavior therapy uh, or in doing diabetes education or in doing whatever else it is they do? And Terry Moyers and I are just finishing up a book now called Effective Psychotherapists. What is it about people, the, the people that provide treatment? And so I think, in a way, what we've been touching on for, for these three, four decades now is uh, what's been called common factors, or what is it that you can do almost no matter what your school of therapy or your profession that makes you a better communicator and means you're more likely to help the people you're working with. Yeah. I'm interested, Bill, in how does your idea of beneficence apply to this? Like, where is beneficence in, in relation to the things that you're talking about? Well, we, we added that to capture it in the third edition because you can use some of this very same tech to sell automobiles or to, to make sales do things and so on and the emphasis there is the reason that we're having this conversation is the other person's well-being not mine yeah. and so this is not for me to get people to do what i want them to do yeah. this is to help them be happy to help them be healthy to help them move in a positive direction a conversation so um previous editions moved away from the notion that it's only that it's not just people with problems of concern um that these ideas apply to it actually changes for all of us and something it's that we all need to do um how do you see um am i relating to people managing problems of concern at the moment what is its role in that work as you see it with i'm sorry i didn't hear what is the role of mi in um supporting people who are managing their own behaviors of concern ah well i mean that's primarily what you're doing with motivational interviewing it's in a way it um it evokes self-control it evokes self-regulation um and it, it it almost doesn't matter what the topic is uh, because the style that you use in working with people is pretty much the same so it's adapted that much i mean if you're going to do this with addictions there are particular things you need to know about drugs and so forth but the the style itself is pretty consistent across cultures even and it's it's amazing to me how well this crosses cultures mm. um and it's not just about problems it, it can be applied uh, in growth for example and yeah. in coaching and a whole variety of domains where change is the issue that you're looking at mm. That's why I think, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. That's why I think um, smart recovery works so well. And I've, I've been in the field 18 years. I've, I've worked in different areas um, because it just some of because really it's just about human behavior and trying to improve your mm -hmm. current situation and mm -hmm. lining it with your values that you'd like life to be in. And, and Brianna McGeoch, excuse me for my um, pronunciation, but she talked about smart generally being an abstinent focus program and how do you reconcile i guess some of the tensions around that but i think we kind of can answer that brianna in regards to it isn't just about a substance you know yes some people do need to make the change and be abstinent from certain substances because of the damage it's caused but this is much more than about just alcohol or about drugs it's about improving someone's general well-being and trying to uh, remove those hooks in their lives that are misaligned for the values than the way they really want to live their life, you know? So, Bill, my next question is just how um, do we um, apply this um, as a brief intervention, you know? How do we do the work that we're meant to be doing of engaging, focusing, evoking and planning without kind of just um, rushing in 
how do we slow this down to actually hear people and to listen? Well, not bearing in mind and smart, we may only have 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> how do we slow it down? How do we do the best as a brief intervention is the question. Well, motivational living inherently is a brief intervention, I think. I mean, there, there is no long-term motivational interviewing. Uh, uh, and so this is something that can be done within the span of time you have. A good example is primary care, where the doctor is seeing a patient every 12 minutes or every 15 minutes or so, and has other things to do, but may have a few minutes to have a brief conversation about making a change in the interest of one's health. And it can be done in, in the context of just brief conversations like that. Um, now, it's important to uh, establish a working relationship or a trust, what we call engaging uh, process, but that doesn't have to take a long time. If you begin listening to people and affirming them and being interested in how they understand reality, that's pretty engaging to begin with and establishes trust relatively quickly. And you can see it happen with it uh, if you're watching demonstrations of motivational interviewing. The person just kind of relaxes and begins to talk more openly, honestly, and and so if you if you don't have very long, this is a very good way to do it. Um, yeah. Physicians sometimes motivational interviewing and and that's my response, that if you don't have very long, actually, this is the best thing to be doing with the time that you have. And, and one thing that I um, try and encourage people to be uh, mindful of in smart recovery meetings, let's say, for instance, you may have someone from probation who comes into that environment feeling really coerced, being told that they have to be there. And they may also think that you are part of probation. So when you ask them what brought you to Smart Recovery, what would you like to talk about? And they go like this, I was made to come here. This is a lot of whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be here. I encourage them to say, well, we've got to, we've got to look into something still keeping that person on that seat if they're not handcuffed. So we have to understand their motivation. Now we know probation's motivation. And I ask them when you explore that, what stage of change are they in regards to the drug use? Well, pre-contemplative, because they're quite annoyed about being there and wanting to talk about this. But what stage of change are they in regards to staying out of prison? And you start seeing that shift. Well, the motivations to stay out of prison is evident because they've come here wanting a form to be stamped to stay out of jail. So speak mm -hmm. into that. But first and foremost, it's important to build that connection with them. So empathize with them. I'm sorry to hear that. That sounds really frustrating that someone's made you come along here and look, this is confidential. I'm nothing to do with probation. I want you to get the best, of, you know, and, and connect with them. And you just see that kind of, okay, <laughs> now what, what my perception of this is different now. I've made some type of connection and we can start to have those conversations as time goes on. But uh, yeah, understanding what's the true motivation for that person and trying to unpack that and not bang your head against the wall and be in a different stage of change to where that person is, you know. You, you, well, you can't be in a different stage of change than where they are. So it's it's being a companion with them wherever they are. I, I have not met very many people with significant alcohol drug problems who were truly pre -con. It will sound like it if you begin trying to persuade them to change. But part of them knows this is not a good thing. There's a downside to it. And when you listen well, you can open them up to talk about that as well. And that's motivational interview began. We, we did develop the assessment feedback piece. If you run into people who truly don't to give you. Uh, and so if you're thinking pre-contemplators, that combination of a good assessment with some feedback and a motivational interviewing style is, is one of the best things I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Um, so I'll move on. We we do have some questions that are coming through, and um, so I, I am I am looking at them, everybody, um, and I'm just trying to see what our, how our time goes and getting through the questions that were posed prior to the meeting. So I will um, have a look at them, if we can um, discuss some of them at some point. Um, so the next question I have there. 
when participants display some dissonance or sustained talk or there's some conflict that's arisen in, in, the, in the setting that we're in with the discussions we're having, what have you found the best approach to get back on track quickly rather than mm -hmm. it fragmenting and being? It, it's basic Carl Rogers. I mean, it, it's good listening. It's with a person who comes in arms crossed and doesn't want to be there. Uh, you can reflect the feelings of you're, you're really angry about this. Here's some mm -hmm. talk about that. You just connect with the person. But but reflecting what they're telling you is probably the simplest thing. Uh, either a simple reflection or a complex reflection or an amplified reflection. But in some way, acknowledging what the person is saying rather than disagreeing with it or trying to talk mm -hmm. them out of it. It's, it's what uh, skillful police officers do in de-escalating uh, uh, someone who's really wired up and potentially violent. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm. And I think and it's, um, way, I will add something that it looks from our more recent research like softening or decreasing sustained talk and discord is at least as important as evoking change talk. Mm. Um, if you're getting very much kind of persistent resistance, to use an older term, uh, that's not a good sign. Uh, and you need to kind of diffuse that and soften that and call forth some of the change talk. Mm. And that combination, it's really the ratio of change talk to sustained talk that seems to be a good predictor of whether change is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And someone just did comment about the writing reflex. Um, and it's something that I, mm. I talk about in training quite a lot is that for the most part, uh, we're all in this line of work because we want to help people you know make some changes in their life and we want to see some healing in people's lives but there's something about it it's a natural mm -hmm. instinct to want to jump in and fix it whether it's a uh yeah. you know a, a gender trait i know my wife says you're always trying to fix things Dad. you know and i just need mm -hmm. you to listen <laughs> uh there's a yeah. video that went around youtube some time ago with nail in her head it's like if you just take the nail out it will stop hurting him but i just need you to listen yeah. i need you to listen no 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 i don't think that's what you do need you need to get the nail out of your head that will help <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. so how do we yeah. um, how do we hold back on that because it's something that i find uh, so easily we fall into that trap oh well, yeah well the motivation is right but the method is wrong i mean we, we go into these professions because we do want to help people but just have this sort of mistaken idea that the way to do that is to tell people what to do. Now, sometimes that's true, but not very often. And you only have to think about your reaction if you're ambivalent about something and a person tells you what you ought to do. Uh, human beings just don't respond particularly well to that. And in fact, tend to give the counter arguments to it. And what we know from our research now is that doing that, counseling in a way that causes the person to argue against change is actually decreasing the likelihood that they're going to change. So there's a lot of restraint involved in motivational interviewing. Uh, you don't have to say everything that comes into your head uh, and you don't have to fix it. And, well, and trusting the method itself is, is a big part of it. Uh, just in you that wants to say, but I can, I know the answer. I can tell you what to do here. We, there are ways in which we do that in MI, uh, but it's not a starting place. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And and sometimes there may be in a group setting, uh, as a facilitator, you have a duty of care there to get certain information to them, but mm -hmm. we're always encouraging them to, how do you get them to come up with that? So it's not not that it's manipulative, but it uh, it's a, it's around asking the right questions so that they engage their brain to say, ah, oh, okay, that might not be a good idea. Or for instance, you know, someone that might want to just stop drinking alcohol after a significant period on it mm -hmm. is dangerous. We know it can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So when someone says, oh, that's it, my plan for this week, I'm just going to stop drinking alcohol, mm -hmm. our instinct is to, well, let me just tell you my expertise is that you know and get into this kind of educational prescription mode so it's about 
how do I ask that of them? How do I ask that of the group and get them to come up with that? Because it's much more powerful if they can own that information and, mm -hmm. and absorb it. Yeah. Diabetes educators are a good example of that. I mean, their job is kind of to download all this information and a way to do it. But there is an MI way of doing it. Uh, and you can start by just asking something on what do you already know about this? So, what would you like to know? What would be most helpful to you? What are you most interested in? So that rather than just giving the same routine speeches to all of your patients, you're interacting with them in a way that respects their interests. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, that's great, thank you, Bill. Uh, number six here. Uh, when considering the stages of change, and it's clear motivational interviewing uh, can be beneficial in those early stages when you're trying to get people to some awareness and some understanding of the situation. When you progress through that, when you're in the maintenance stage and I guess the honeymoon period of being abstinent or making these changes starts to kind of just calm down and you, you're faced with the reality of how hard life can be without a certain behavior as a bit of a crutch or a self-medicating kind of process. Um, and also when you get into lapse, relapse, or I think I've heard it called recycling, which I really like because it makes me think that it's never, it's never a waste. <laughs> There's always an opportunity to learn and I learn the most when things are going wrong. <laughs> I've been very good. So when you're in those latter stages, or at, for the want of a better word, those, those stages of maintenance and making mistakes and coming back and making mistakes, and how can we best kind of utilize these motivational skills and keeping people on track so they don't just disappear for good. Mm -hmm. Way of being, it's become clearer that it can be useful whatever stage of change the person is in. I mean, the most obvious place is where we started, which is helping people who are ambivalent in contemplation move off of that into preparation and action. But maintenance is a great example of, a, of a, a place where this way of being with people is very helpful. And particularly around this concept of relapse. Ending actually in both editions of our book on treating addiction, that we let go of that term, that we stop thinking in terms of relapse. It's not something that is used much in, uh, in treating hypertension or obesity. Uh, or diabetes. I mean, if if you come back to the hospital in a glycemic crisis uh, as a diabetic, they don't say to you, "You've relapsed." You know, uh, really, the practical question is, well, what what do we need to do with the treatment plan? What do we need to do to to change here so that um, you can you can get back on track again? But we've gotten stuck on that idea of relapse in the addiction field. even accurate. Whoops. Let's see. Yeah, Just had a little refresh up. page. You, you are back. There. Yep, yep. Still hearing me? Okay. Um, it's not even accurate. If you, if you look at treatment outcomes and you actually measure drinking, you find a whole continuum of outcomes. And it's not just that there are those who abstain and then all the rest are failures. A huge study that we did, we those who had stayed abstinent for a year and then looked at all the rest, and their drinking had gone down by 87%. Now, that's pretty medically significant, uh, and yet we have kind of talked ourselves into thinking that unless you have perfection, you're a failure. That's not human nature, uh, that's not what you do in treating chronic illnesses. It's not what you do in trying to help people change behavior. So instead of talking about relapse or looking for a, a synonym that might be better, like a lapse or recurrence or a recycling, or whatever, it's just behavior. The person drank, yeah. that's all. And you don't have to give it particular meaning. Uh, that's, that's just what it is. And if a, you're treating someone for uh, diabetes, and they ate too much sweets. Well, they ate too much sweets. That's what they did. 
what's what's the next step yeah. here? Yeah. Um, we've we've got ourselves in a kind of a corner in the addiction field historically, in and it's bad for us too, because it means our success rates are really low. You know, well, only if you define success rate as perfection. Yeah but we're not perfect you know? i mean human beings tend to change little at a time over time very common outcome in in drinking at least is to have longer and longer spans of time go by between drinking episodes and the drinking episodes to get shorter and less mm. severe and that's a good outcome for any chronic illness yeah. by the way you know? if if you use the sta the data that we have in addiction and say what would you be happy with uh 24 percent complete remission and everyone else 87 percent better would that be a good outcome for diabetes or hypertension or the well, <laughs> you would it'd be amazing mm -hmm. you know uh but instead we've just told ourselves that we're a failure yeah. if, uh, if we have to help people be and that's and that's really tricky isn't it i mean because i think over the years my experience and i think we're we're used to thinking around alcohol or drugs is that if you're going to make a change, you just need to stop. You know, it's like this, it has to be this abstinent, complete abstinence and not. And I feel that just puts a lot of pressure on people. Uh, so with SMART, yes, some are abstinent oriented, but some of them are actually just trying to change behavior and make improvements. And if you say, as you say, you're going for perfection, which abstinence is, it makes it sometimes quite unattainable for people. Uh, and that's what we're trying to avoid in my groups, I find. Well, it sets you up for a persuasion struggle also. Mm -hmm. that you're going to champion abstinence why they don't want to do that. And that's the wrong spot to be in. Mm -hmm. I should tell you, the first 10 years of my research, people to moderate their drinking. So people would come in who were drinking but didn't want to stop drinking. Uh, and we have good methods for doing that. But what we found was that many more people going through that program quit than actually maintain moderation. Mm -hmm. And they and they didn't do it because they failed. They didn't do it because they tried to moderate and found they couldn't do it. What they told us was one of two things, actually, or both of them. One is, this is really hard. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling a lot to maintain moderation, you know. And the second thing is, what's the point? I mean, why drink so little? You know? uh, and so if I'm working this hard to drink that little, I might as well just quit. And they did. You know? So ironically, a moderation program, which for some people did help them to moderate their drinking, you know? for people who are already having difficulties with it, it really helped them to decide, you know, the easiest thing for me is just to quit. Mm. And say, well, okay makes sense to me but they get there by themselves they get there through that process don't they that's the thing and they do it's not a yeah of you but but uh, with your with your assistance yeah mm, yep yeah, yeah absolutely um i, I just uh, noticed a question there um around dual diagnosis i guess mm. um does MI work for people with dual diagnosis and maybe significant mental health challenges they're facing? What would be different in that population, Bill? The, the approach itself is not different. I mean, the, you've got more problems, of course, to deal with. But motivational interviewing is now being used in, in treating of depression and treatment of people with schizophrenia to help them maintain their med medications and not get rehospitalized. So used across the board for a whole range of problems and I mean my joke about dual diagnosis is it, it's a good outcome if you just get down to two diagnoses that's that's a good thing you know because very often you're starting with a much wider panoply than that in addiction treatment we used to think it was a kind of rare subgroup but but actually most everybody coming into treatment for a substance use disorder you can find other things in the DSM that they're struggling with, and indeed other medical problems as well. Yeah, yeah, and I think we can quite easily jump to just labeling people and trying to fit them in a box because it makes it easier for us to 
come up with some solution or some way of helping them and stuff. But you know, we really need to start thinking more broadly, don't we, when it comes to those things? Well, in fact, um, the danger with an expert model is if I just collect enough information, then I will have the answer for you. And usually that's not true. When what needs to change is the person's behavior and lifestyle, you don't have the answer for them. But together yeah. you can you can work it out. You know? But watch, watch out for that idea. If I just ask enough questions or the clever questions or the right questions, then I'll know what to tell them. But telling them is not the way to help them change. Yeah, yeah. And I think we ask, probably ask too many questions and don't listen enough, Bill. We, we've got two ears and one mouth, so we should be listening twice as much. Mm -hmm. so. um, that's our ratio, uh, two, two reflections per question <laughs> what we try to shoot for, yeah. Yeah, there you go. It's anatomically in line with motivational interview. Mm -hmm. um, Angie, I don't know if the microphone is working or not. Can you speak? For some reason, Angie's gone silent on us. Um, I'll just ask a question there. Is with SMART being a mutual aid group, how can facilitators manage multiple conversations but also encourage other participants to use these uh, curious questioning skills and some mm -hmm. of the motivational skills? Well, if, if you're asking open questions, the answer to which is change talk, and that, that's a key piece in motivational interviewing, you can do that with a group and you can ask the group simultaneously and have each of them maybe writing down or working on it or thinking about it themselves. Maybe even talking to the person next to them about it. I mean, so the, the, it's the same. And when you, when you have someone who's being resistant, you know, difficult, the way in which you respond to that uh, is important. Uh, and again, softening that is a, is a key thing. But, but this can be done in a group context. It's just giving everybody in the group as much thinking time and air time as possible to be trying out their own change talk and su suggesting how they might do something or why they might do something. And it's, it's a way of thinking about what your goal is in the group. It's, mm. it's not motivations and their own ideas. Yeah, and, and that's true in what way quite often uh, try and explain it in regards to mutual aid and what that really means um, is using those I statements, but it's putting ideas in this metaphorical glass bowl in the middle of the room. You know, everyone chucks their ideas in and then I go to you, Bill, out of all those ideas that have come up, what's really going to work for you though? Because there are other people's ideas. How, how can you see that being implemented in your week and in your plan, you know? Exactly. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Um, you even could can go around the group and have motivational interviews with one person at a time, but if it's a very large group, that gets boring for most people pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. we've got yeah. another guest speaker just come on. Come on. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So I've got my dog down there as well. So thankfully, he won't be jumping up anytime soon. <laughs> That's the joys of uh, everyone working from home now, isn't it? We were just talking about that before we started, Bill, that the, um, this has become the norm now, of these interruptions and kids running in the background when we're trying to have these uh, webinars and meetings on Zoom and stuff, so it's quite funny. But, um, um, yeah, I'll ask a few more questions here, Bill, and I'll see if there's any more that uh, from the group. Uh, we've tried to get through some of the questions that have come through on the little question panel there, but I'll keep an eye on that also. Um, so this was one that Ange um, was reflecting on before. It says, how best do we support participants to work in accordance with their values? How do you see the alignment between MI and ACT? So uh, acceptance commitment therapy, and how, do, how can MI make CBT work better, I guess? Because that's the fundamental principles that we work with SMART is, CBT or ACT and, and motivational interviewing as a, an undercurrent? Well, three different questions there. I mean, they are they do overlap. Yeah, thanks, Ange. Uh, yeah, Steve Hayes and I did a, uh, a, a conversation at the Evolution of Psychotherapy meeting, kind of contrasting ACT and motivational interviewing. And we couldn't find much to disagree about, actually. I mean, the, the way of being with people is is pretty 
uh, say about uh, that in that regard. I learned both person-centered way of being in graduate school, and I learned that first, which I'm very glad about, and then learned cognitive behavior therapy. And to me, this has always been a way of doing cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, you, you can watch lots of different styles, but you can do cognitive behavior therapy in a very person-centered, affirming, uh, reflective, good listening style. Uh, and it simply, it just works better. Uh, you get differences in outcomes of therapists manual guided cognitive behavior therapy. What's that about? I think it's about these kinds of things. Uh, and one of the first and surprising of our research way was that uh, when we measured listening skills, nine therapists, all doing cognitive behavior therapy based on a manual with people with drinking problems. Enormous differences in outcomes from a 100% success rate to a 25% success rate. And most of that, how empathic the counselor was, that is how well they were listening. And that was one of the bits that I went to Norway with that, that first of all, led me to be teaching reflective listening to the psychologist there, but also ultimately to motivational interviewing. That mm -hmm. it's how, it, not just what you do, but how you do it that matters. And, and there's a real how to it that's, that often isn't taught in graduate school. Mm -hmm. It's not. But uh, the manuals don't tell you how to do it. They tell you what to do. And this is the how of it. Yeah. And that just and comes the through practice. Mm. The, the other bit of it was values. And we, we are more and more emphasizing and asking people what they care about most in life. And we have that values card sort that's available free on, online. But helping people to figure out what do they care about most because if you just ask people what are your values you, you don't get a very clear picture but doing that value sort and saying well yes this is this is really important to me and not the most important but and i don't care about that but i kind of care about this and but i think that's one of the most important things first of all it's it's very engaging for the client the person about their values about what they care about the conversation is happening in the context of addiction treatment, the obvious question, which you may not even ask directly, is how does drinking fit into these values? Does it help you to achieve them? Does, does it, it get in the way? Is it irrelevant? I mean, what, what, what do you think about that? Uh, and you just have that discussion together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, and I think um, with the values, I don't think we always really truly take the time to ask ourselves that question. You know, even as facilitators and you know clinicians, experts, whatever people think they are in this, taking the time to actually, what are my values? What are the core beliefs that I have? And we know that core beliefs are shaped through many different ways, whether it be mm -hmm. a cultural upbringing, but we never sometimes just pause to think, do I believe everything my parents taught me? Is there something that's misaligned within my life or is there a behavior that is hooking me away from the values that I really want to uh, live by in the future and actually taking the time. So we hope that these moments where you're asked those questions that you've probably never been asked before in a motivational interviewing setting or a smart recovery setting, that you just at least walk away with just a little bit more awareness so that you can start asking those questions and, and start that process. And it can take time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I've got two or three questions left. I want to just uh, make sure we're on time to finish. Um, there were two questions, quite specific questions, um, Bill, um, around some things. And I'll try and read through them. I'm reading them verbatim so we can try and um, filter exactly what we're asking. Um, but uh, someone asked, how are we better able to support someone who is showing motivation to change verbally, but does not take 
any of the first steps, phoning, drug, making drug counselling appointments, attending appointments, um, or when they are constantly back and forth, yes, I do want to connect. No, I don't want to connect. No, I'm fine. No, I don't want to connect. So how are we better able to support someone that's showing that verbally but doesn't actually take some physical action towards it? And there's not a universe. Um, first step was too big. Uh, maybe you need to break it down a little bit and take a smaller step. And you, you can actually say that to the client. Maybe, maybe I was asking too much of you. And I wonder if there's a smaller step that might be easier to take first. Yeah. So there's that. It it may be that that motivation still is the is an issue, you know? particularly if the person hasn't thought it through that much. If they just say, "Look, I'm just going to quit," you know, but they haven't really thought about why and how and so on. And when people give me a short answer, the kind of thing that they, or they think I want to hear, you know, then I get really curious. Uh, well, why why would you want to do that? Um, and how, given what you know about yourself, how could you actually accomplish that? So sometimes it's spending more time in evoking. Sometimes it's spending more time in planning uh, and taking smaller steps or different steps or lots of different ways to get to the same goal, really. Mm. And doing that kind of problem solving together. Uh, and you know, what, what else does it take? Maybe it's a skill issue. Maybe it, it is a cognitive behavioral skill that the person is, uh, needs a little bit of help with. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you always do this one thing. Rather, the question is, what's happening with this person? And you can ask them, of course, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what's, what's that about as well? And together, problem solving. Yeah. yeah. And, and when it comes to actually making some plans, so in Smart Recovery, where it's always about the seven day, you know, not to overwhelm the big goals in life but just what would you do in the seven days and what I find to ascertain whether these steps they're taking are too big for them in the next seven days is just using the rating skills you know because if you said to them how confident are you that you could stop drinking if that's what you want to do in the next seven days and they say a five out of ten then it mm -hmm. seems uh, a bit uh, not really wise to to plan around that so what can you do that will increase that to a seven, eight or a nine or a different plan that will give you more confidence because a 50-50 chance of success in the next seven days is not really going to be helpful for that person. Um, so it's about taking the smaller goals. And as you say, you're likely to have less ambivalence. You're likely to have more buy-in from the participant. You're likely to see less conflict coming if it's a smaller, more attainable, achievable goal in the seven days. Well, and again, you come back to the binary thinking. If you're asking, how confident are you that you can be perfect? Mm. You know, that, that's difficult. Uh, if a person comes back, they've been drinking every day, they come back, they, they meant to not drink. They come back and say, well, I drank two days this week. You know? That's a reason to celebrate to me. Mm. I mean, they used to be drinking seven days. Now they drank two days. How'd you do that? What was that like for you? you know? And so you're looking for every step in the right direction and affirming that and helping people to take that step and the next step and so on. Uh, and if you, if you fall into binary thinking, uh, how, how confident are you that you can be completely abstinent for the next seven days? Yeah. In a way, it's the wrong question. What could you do to move in the right direction over the next seven days? What do you, what do you think would be possible for you? Mm -hmm. And if you're tapping into their values, let's say some of the reasons for their change is to be a good dad. You know, I find using that language, what can you do in the next seven days to, to improve your relationship with your son or to be a good dad? What would it take? What does it look like? And you might not be directly talking about how do you stop drinking alcohol and get up and take him to school, but you get him thinking and exploring that, well, this is what it will take. This is what I need to do. And in line, the dominoes start to fall into place a little bit um, around some of the other behaviors. So that's great. Thank you for that, Bill. Um, a few, few more minutes, five more minutes or so. I've got another question here, someone very specific again. Um, 
And the third edition of motivational interviewing, helping people change counselling with neutrality, is included as part of the evoking process. After the focusing process section, how it occurs to me that a client who is ambivalent about changing their substance use cannot nominate a goal or direction for change in the focusing stage if we have not addressed, resolved their ambivalence. Some elucidation of this would be appreciated. Does that make, does that make sense, that question? Well, I think so. I mean, focusing is, is coming to shared goals. Hmm. So it's, I mean, in, in the addiction treatment field I entered, it was about imposing goals. Here are your goals, you know. Uh, and of course that doesn't work very well. What is the person willing to do? And, and here you enter into the domain of harm reduction. Hmm. Are they willing to take some steps in the right direction that may be short of everything you hope they would do? But is that okay? Or are you going to fire them from treatment because they won't do everything you want them to do? So what, what steps can you take to, to be safer, to be healthier, to be a better dad? How can you move in that direction? Mm. And it's maybe, maybe session after session, having that kind of brainstorming, successive approximations uh, way of going about things that is just is different. And we're not only interested in drinking. I mean, at least I hope that you're not only interested in that. Mm. Interested in the person having a good life. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, in the community reinforcement approach, our goal is for the person to have a life so good they would never give it up yeah. for a drug. Absolutely. That's, that's really, really key, isn't it? It's beyond just one thing, isn't it? And it's uh, looking at these pillars in your life. And I think sometimes we focus too much on a substance that if I just get off this, everything will be fine. Or if I just invest in this relationship, or if I have a job, or if I have you know, my health, then they neglect the lifestyle balance that we need because the storms will come and it will smash one of those pillars down. Possibly someone may yeah. pass away or you yeah. may lose a job and current climate, people are doing that with hundreds of thousands of people. But if you have multiple pillars in your life and you're working on many aspects of your life, you're going to get through it, aren't you? You're going to just build more resolve and build more uh, strengthening, I guess, moving forward. And, Mm -hmm. So I guess the final question I've left to the end, and I know we're coming to our time, and I know there may be some questions we've missed around role-playing, change talk and that, and I, I didn't want to do it an injustice from my perspective in coming up with a random scenario for you to play out. What I would encourage is that there are multiple examples of change talk scenarios on YouTube around motivational interviewing, and um, so I'm sure that you would be able to find something around that. But the final question, Bill, um, before we let you go, um, what ways can we best hone our skills as a facilitator or a clinician? Moving out from this. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I learned the hard way that coming to a two-day workshop with me does not skills. Uh, in a way, I realize now it's like coming to a two-day workshop on how to play the piano. <laughs> You'll learn some things about the white keys and black keys and how it sounds and scales and so on. But you won't be the end thought that you would. I thought that you just sit with me for two days and you got it. You know? yeah. People believe that actually. So so they thought they were doing motivational interviewing. We're very happy that they were doing it. And then when we listened to the practice tapes, there was no evidence that I had been there. Yeah. So that raised the better question of what does it take for people to get good at this? And it turns out it takes certainly the, the training, initial training, but practice with feedback and some coaching. You know? Practice, feedback, and coaching, which is the way you learn any complex skill like music, like a sport. You, know? uh, you have someone who's better at it, watch you, or make a suggestion and help you do a little better and so we got a big difference with five half hour telephone calls coaching you know? uh, but it's just trying it out being able to bounce it off of somebody else who knows uh, always on, based on observed practice listening and, and have access to what you're actually doing in order 
Otherwise, it's like telling your piano teacher, but don't listen to me because I'd be too embarrassed. You know? uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not going to work. I, I will say that. Yeah, and I, and I like that. Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to say that. I, I love that analogy of the, the piano. Sorry, Bill, the, yeah. the time lag there, so I apologize. I love the, the, the analogy of music because if you're going to ask anyone, whether they're a famous musician or anything, have you mastered music? No one would ever say they have. They're always learning, and it's That's comforting right. to know even someone like someone like you <laughs> is I'm still so not mastered the art of all in front of you. And I mean, that's very comforting for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wanted to say that if you if you're interested in learning more about this, there is an Australian company called Psychwire, with whom Steve Rolnick and Terry Moyers and I have worked, and I'm really happy with the online course they have developed. Uh, and and that's accessible, so they're, it's offered several times a year, uh, right out of Australia. So I didn't know anything about the company, but uh, Judy Beck of Cognitive Therapy fame had done a course with them and was very complimentary. And she was right; they really know what they're doing. Yeah. yeah well, I've just posted a, a link to that, oh. so um, if anyone wants to check that out, Psychwire Courses in Australia, and. Um, yeah, uh, that's been really, really helpful. Uh, I mean, we're just over our time. Um, I know, Ange, you did have your microphone back, so I oh, might just oh. um, get you to finish up in a little second. But, Bill, uh, I just cannot thank you enough. Uh, we've had so many fantastic comments about how helpful this has been. Um, we've been really very privileged to have you take part in the webinar today. Um, and I guess just to encourage people out there, whether it's smart recovery or whether it's just your own clinical work, uh, that we will never be perfect at this, uh, just like our participants. That's not what we should be asking. We should just be asking for a growth uh, and, I guess, uh, an awareness of how we can make changes that are within our control. As we know, there are many things in life at the moment that are without our control, but what can we control? What can we manage our own lives? And what are the motivations and the values that are underpinning that? So. It's been very, very thankful for that, Bill, and I appreciate that. Angela, is there anything you want to just wrap no, up with? No, just thank you, Bill. That's amazing. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, sorry your sound was closed off for I a while know, there. I don't know, for half an hour. <laughs> really sorry, people. No, yeah. pleasure, so, pleasure to do this, and, and it's nice to have another connection back to Australia where Bill yeah. met Steve. Yeah, so. Yeah, absolutely. And you're always welcome back, Bill, uh, if you're ever back in yeah, Brisbane. We have a spare room. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Bill, again. And thank you, everybody, for joining uh, today. Hopefully, uh, it's been helpful for you and that this uh, webinar is recorded, so you should receive a link to the recording uh, as soon as it's finished. And please keep in touch uh, with the future webinars that we run at Smart Recovery. And also, if you are interested in Smart Recovery, if you've joined us from an organization that hasn't uh, been aware of it, please check our website out at Smart Recovery Australia. But again, uh, it's been wonderful to have you along, Bill, and thank you for everyone. Thank you, Ange, for your participation today. And um, what's the cast name again? I can't remember. Yeah. Thank you to him <laughs> as well. <laughs> thank you, guys. So, have a lovely uh, everyone, day, everybody. Everyone take care. Thank you. Have a good Thanks, morning. Bye-bye.